I should probably start with a quick, um, I suppose, um, service announcement. I'm not actually a doctor, which is um, a phrase I've used in other circumstances uh, before. So in terms of ask I'm an expert, I may not be as good as you think. Um, I think before I actually say what discuss Treasure Trove, I think it's important to say what Treasure Trove actually isn't. Um, and uh, this is past my favourite archive photograph, and um, it's a bunch of people protesting outside the old National Museums of Antiquities about um, objects being taken to Edinburgh and kept there. Um, and actually, as many of you know, Edinburgh is stuck in an early 60s time warp, so this was actually taken yesterday. Um, <laughs> the, and I put this up because I think Treasure Trove is still seen as kind of like a hoovering mechanism for National Museums of Scotland to acquire objects, which that certainly isn't the case. Treasure Trove is actually a system that is independent of the National Museums, and the principle is very simple. It's that objects of cultural significance or historical significance are preserved in museums for everyone's benefit. The preference is for local museums. So Treasure Trove in many ways is the, I suppose, ultimate destination of the material you might find or excavate, be that from metal detecting, field walking, or targeted um, archaeological strategy and excavation. Uh, any, unlike other legislation, objects don't have to be made of precious metal. There is no time limit, for example, objects do not have to be over 300 years old, as in some jurisdictions, which can actually be very helpful for us. Um, and what I would like to do as well, I'm, Treasure of itself is very simple. If you want, if you, I'm not really going to talk about the system, I'm not really going to talk, you know, there will be no flowcharts today, if you like. Uh, one other thing I would say is that the role of the Treasure of Unit, of which I am um, uh, run, um, it's a very loose definition of responsibility. Um, we are based in Edinburgh, we do not sit in Edinburgh, we are not sedentary, we move about. For example, we deal a lot with metal detectors, this is a rally in Perth. This is my colleague Natasha Bergson excavating the, height, the site of a medieval coin hoard in uh, north of Scotland. So we are very active, we do a lot of outreach and engagement. So I'm not really going to talk about Treasure Trove System, we have a website. Um, at most, I promise you will only ever have to fill in a single side of A4 if you want anything done. What I'm going to talk about instead are artefacts that you might find during the course of your field work, be that excavation or survey. Majority of the finds I deal with are uh, metal detector finds. Um, it's very easy to forget that prior to metal detecting being popular, the most important productive sites which re, uh, produce artefacts repeatedly in Scotland were actually in dynamic dune areas, coastal areas which were under threat of erosion. Culbin Sands and Murray, you have everything from a massive Iron Age uh, armlet, early Bronze Age mould, medieval pot mens and rivets and an early historic sword pommel. A lot of metal finds. Loose sands and priests of Galloway, again uh, very uh, characteristic of the early Bronze Age is faience beads. Lithics, pottery, what you'd expect. Less obvious again, metal finds. This probably looks a bit like a tractor handle. It's actually a late Bronze Age uh, crescent knife, probably a leather worker's knife. Again, not particularly great looking find, it's actually a Roman brooch, really significant stuff. Um, and again, uh, with lithics, um, it's often very easy to um, think of them as a, another bag of blasted stones, to quote uh, a colleague of mine. We do have really significant finds, often again from coastal environments. Scandinavian uh, Neolithic uh, projectile point, found in the late 90s and 10, at that time the only one known, as far as I know, perhaps still the only one known from the UK. Um, perhaps more obvious finds, uh, Neolithic carstone ball uh, found in the beach near Port Mahomet. When I say obvious, not if you're a teenage boy who you uh, take it home and put it in your sock drawer. Uh, the only artefact I've had which turned up smelling of lynx body spray, um, <laughs> safely now going through the system. Um, incomplete object, something like this, another beach find at Neg. Um, what is it? Well, it's actually a broken object. It's a Neolithic, or I should say Neolithic, early Bronze Age cushion mace head. Again, not a lot of these going about. This was just ro uh, rolling around in the beach in the uh, surf zone. 
Uh, things like this, uh, stone discs, I don't know what they're for, no one does apparently. Characteristic of uh, Iron Age sites in the uh, Northern Isles, we do find a lot of these on uh, beaches for example. Other odd stone objects, again beach finds from the Northern Isles, these are hugely important. This would fit in the palm of my hand, very small object. They are toy rotary querns are associated with Viking sites. Um, again, perhaps not an obvious find. So these are stone objects. The one thing I really want to emphasize is the survivability potential of metal objects in the tidal zone and anything, to be honest, which is not the ply zone. This is a selection of finds which date from the medieval period, the 14th century, up to the 17th and 18th centuries. These are all from Burnt Island Beach. You can see how well preserved they are. And these lead alloy objects here, the majority of these would not have survived in the plough soil, for example. A um, good example of these are, these are medieval annular brooches. They are effectively dress fittings. They are made of a lead alloy, incredibly fragile objects. All the examples we have from Scotland are from beach contexts uh, where they can be preserved without any uh, disturbances that you might associate with the agricultural zone. Again, amazing preservation of objects, good find from uh, Beaton's and Friesen Galloway. It's a medieval strap fitting. Effectively, you, you, you uh, trapped a leather belt in this hinge mechanism here. This still works. Um, the, the potential, I think, for just good quality objects is, is something we with metal objects, something we should recognise. Something like this, again, not obvious. Uh, this one is from Durness. It's remains of a 16th to 17th century Highland brooch. Again, we're seeing a lot of these through uh, um, chance finds um, in erosional scars on beaches. Less obvious finds. This is a 17th century toy gun from the beach at Ayr. Um, not a lot of these survive at all. Even less obvious finds, something like this. Uh, this is a set of a, uh, a, a set of the lid of a set of weights. Uh, it is German. It would, was made in Nuremberg. We hopefully have the makers marked. Found on a beach because they were not legally used in Scotland, and beaches tend to be areas where um, a black market, if you like, could take place. Um, Something, you see our website in the moment, we are going through uh, revamp, we're designing a series of identification resources that uh, can be used. These are going up in the website at the moment, we're starting with the period we know and uh, working backwards. And this is something we are very much doing as a general public. If, for example, you feel it would be helpful to have a resource like this targeted at finds from um, the shore area, that is something we, uh, you know, we could talk about and consider. And just lastly and finally, uh, this is our website address and uh, like us on Facebook as I must remember to tell you. Thank you. <laughs>